we're going to talk today about why you should make your applications, and not only your applications, but all of your services, highly configurable. And it has to be done with little effort, because otherwise, you know, we, we all know developers are lazy. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it, right? Um, and, well, we're not that lazy, but we don't want to work more than it's really necessary. So I, I mentioned in, in my starting presentation how in this world in which we need to move much faster, we need to be able to create this complex system from a smaller reusable building blocks. And both customizability and configuration are a key ingredient to be able to reuse all these, these little modules. So those of you who have read The Pragmatic Programmer, a very famous book for, famous book for, um, for developers, we know that that's one of, of the very important advices that they give. Make your applications very configurable. And I remember when I first read that, uh, I was all into this agile thing, then do whatever you don't need. And I said, these guys are, are crazy. I'm not going to make it configurable if I don't need it. And over time, I've really ended up understanding how it's so important to make your applications configurable, because otherwise, it will be much harder to do it later. Now, the key thing is, if it's hard, it's a really tough call. So the thing is, my conclusion is that, that good applications are really highly configurable. But what I, as I was saying, that comes at a cost. That comes as, often as a big cost. So over the last two years, actually, we've been reviewing how do people, how do we ourselves make our applications configurable? And actually, in Library, we have several mechanisms that if you are developing on top of Library, it's easier than if you are developing outside of Library, right? So what are the most common ways that that people configure applications, that we ourselves configure the applications that we do on top of Liferay. So probably number one is properties file, right? A properties file is very convenient. You just put the file somewhere, you read it. Um, some people prefer many properties files. Uh, at Liferay, as you know, we prefer a super, 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 super long properties file called portal.properties, which just keeps getting longer and longer until now, of course. Um, and properties files are, as I said, convenient. You just put a uh, property there. It's property value, kind of easy to understand, at least. Uh, maybe not very powerful if your configuration is, is complicated. But with, a, with certain conventions, you can get away from it. One problem with properties files is that it's not that easy to read them on the fly, right? So if you modify portal.properties, and you need to restart the server. And that's, that's kind of a pain, right? And we've actually tried several mechanisms so that it reloads automatically, and it was horrible for, for performance. Uh, so we, we ended up not doing it. And the second big problem in a, in a complex environment like Liferay of these properties files is if you change a property there, that property has that same value for the whole portal. So if you have many companies, if you have many Portal instances, it will all have the same value. If you have many sites, they will all have the same value. If you have many portlets, they will all have the same value. So what do we do? So we're a portal. We support the portlet spec. And the portlet spec has this part of the spec, which are the portlet preferences. The portlet preferences are meant mainly for end user preferences. But they provide an automatic um, a storage mechanism, value pair, very simple. And you have a very powerful scoping mechanism, which is the portlet itself and wherever it's placed. So one day, one guy thought, hey, I can use that for all of my configuration needs. Right? And, and, and that, that guy um, made a very bad choice. And we've paid for it. And for that reason, they've made me be here and pay my penitence, confessing that was a bad choice. Portlet preferences are great for storing portlet preferences, not for storing all sorts of configuration. And then, obviously, when you have more complex configurations, you end up creating your own solution with a more complex file storage, XML, JSON, YAML, whatever, or in the database. However, 
we think we can do much better. And actually, almost over two years ago, Ray and I were struggling with this, and we started writing code, and we actually never had time to, to finish it. But fortunately, some other people with much more, much more passion suffering the same problems, such as Ivan Zaira or, or Jürgen and other people involved, came here and have ended up building a really awesome solution that I want them to be able to, and in this case, Jürgen, to be able to present in person. And that's the configuration API of Life Race 7. Thank you, Jorge. So, uh, as Jorge mentioned, we have been working, well, uh, for two years in the new configuration API. So I'm going to show you some of the characteristics or, and benefits of this API. So the goal that we want to present to you is that it's, uh, we want to make software very configurable with the minimum effort. That's what we strive for with this configuration API. So, as you have, been, as you have heard the last two days, uh, we are trying to modularize uh, the portal, and we want to take all the benefits of OSGI. So, we didn't reinvent the wheel with the configuration uh, API. We are borrowing some of the uh, features of OSGI. So, now we are going to show you some of the requirements for a good configuration of enterprise applications and what we have, been, what we have implemented in the API. So, we are giving supports to avoid configuration errors. This is very important for us. Why? Jorge has mentioned this. Portlet preferences, for example, don't support types. Here, we don't know, for example, if class name ID, is that, is that an integer, is that a long? We don't know. We don't have any strings here, booleans. We actually don't know. What about portlet properties? We don't know either. So, isn't this actually easier for it, uh, to read for everyone here? Here, we know exactly authentication. It's Boolean, authentication uh, type string. We also have arrays. It's much easier, right? So you are going to ask, what about the default values that we have seen before? Where are they? We have annotations for them. Here you can check. This, uh, I'm going to show it in the next slide. Uh, we have some properties, for example, for authentication. The default value is false. We also have authentication type default value is basic, and it's not required. And this is much easier to read with annotations. Where can we find these annotations? BND, OSGI Enterprise R6. Uh, we take them from there. So if you want to check all of the annotations, uh, you can find them here. We have been talking about this the last two days, and everything is documented in this aspect. So what do we get also from OSGI? Dynamic configuration of components with high performance. What has uh, Jorge mentioned? We don't need to restart our modules, or we don't need to stop everything. We can get it. Uh, I will show you how we can get the configuration for our components. First, we have to give a unique ID to our interface. In this case, full bar, my configuration, through another annotation. And then we can get it injected in any component. Just as Carlos Sierra mentioned in previous presentations, through uh, activate we can get this, conf uh, this configuration and through configurable, create configuration. And it's that easy to get our configuration. There is no big science here. So, but what if it changes? We also support the modified annotation, so it will automatically propagate uh, when our component changes. 
So we already mentioned the property files, but what if we have also property files? Uh, OSCI also supports hot deploy. So we can just copy and paste it to any folder that it's listening to. And it will also propagate the configurations values that we specify. It has to follow the certain standards. Uh, as, you sh as you know, the, as you see, the package and configuration class, and it's a properties file. So uh, we also have uh, the ability to, uh, to have different configurations for the same applications through different scopes. Uh, what are different scopes? We already know that. We have the system scope. It doesn't show too well here. We have also the common, uh, company or portal instance scope. We have the site or group scope. And we have the portlet instance scope. So we support configuration for the same application for all of these scopes. And we hide the complexity to make it easier also for the developers. How do we do that? First, we need the configuration factory. That, through our reference, as we have heard in the previous presentations. And next, we have different locators for the different scopes. In this case, it's the company scope. We need the name of the class that we specified with our configuration. We need the company ID, and we need the service name. With that, we can have the configuration. We know that it's, this is the most complex part of the configuration API, and we are thinking of making it easier also. But we want some feedback, if you want, at the end of this presentation to know exactly how we could do that. Then another important thing here, or concept, is about the default values. What if the configuration value is not found at the portlet instance? Then it will fall back to the site. If it's not found, it will fall back to the portal instance. And if it's not found, it will go back to the system, fall back to the system. And if not, it's null. There is no configuration value. With that in mind, for example, the locator for group, we have it receives the group ID and also the service name. If it doesn't find the value, it will fall back to company. It will fall back later to system. What happened? Don't worry. And it's the same for portlet instance. Uh, if it, it has its own locator, and if it doesn't fi uh, find the value, it will fall back. It, this one receives the layout ID and portlet ID since it's in a specific page. So we know exactly uh, where the configuration is for it, each portlet. Now, many are wondering, uh, for example, if we want to access the configuration in a view, a JSP, for example. So we wanted to make it easier for you and for everyone else, basically. And we decided to create a method in portlet display that gets you the configuration base on a class. So if you are, for example, and you have the request or you have portlet display, you can call this method with the class, and you will get automatically the configuration in that page. It's very important, and it's very easy to use. Another important aspect is that we provide an automatically generated user interface. We know that the configuration can be accessed through the, through the console, through the OSGI console, but we also provide configuration admin. So 
in configuration admin, what do we get? We get the configuration for, uh, for portlets, for system instance, for company. But this is only, as we mentioned in the slide before, it's for system scope so far. Uh, we are working uh, in making this in the future, future releases, to making this uh, configuration available at portlet instance, if I am not mistaken. So what do we get here? Remember the attributes in the annotations that we mentioned before? For example, we can have now also name. We can, guide, we can give description. So when you see the user interface, for example, for iframe configuration, that's the values that will be displayed. And here, you can change the values directly, and it will propagate to that portlet or to that site. That's very important. We are talking about the default values, not the values that are already uh, that the values are already configured in that portlet. That's also very important. So, and uh, with that, I will leave Jorge with the roadmap uh, of what we want to do in the future with okay. the configuration. So that you don't read that. Uh -huh because otherwise you wouldn't listen to me. So this is, it, it, it probably looks like a very simple API. And you might be wondering, did we spend two years doing this? And the truth is, we've spent two years writing code, deleting code, writing code, deleting code. And actually, um, what you see is, is much, much simpler than other solutions that we've, we've had in the past. Actually, the only really complicated thing is the automatic search of defaults. And it's probably not obvious to you yet as well, uh, not, not yet how useful that is. Uh, in fact, as different teams uh, within Liferay have been using this configuration API, the first reaction is, I used to have one line, and now your invocation is three, four lines if I, if I format it appropriately. But as we are applying it much more, what we are seeing is we are just removing tons and tons of code. And not only we are removing tons of code, but we are realizing some things that were wrong. The search for defaults is one of them. So first, one problem we are finding as we are applying this API that we used to have is if you want to uh, retrieve the configuration, let's say, for uh, the company, the, the portal instance the scope, we always had this code that is, if there is some value at the company level, then use that. Otherwise, searching the properties. So we ended up creating these utility classes, such as prefs, props, uh, whatever, so that it, does, it at least encapsulates that. But then, what if you are at the site scope? Uh, in that case, then you, you have if clauses everywhere. And what happens is that sometimes you search in all scopes, sometimes you don't. But it gets even worse when you get to the portlet instance, because how many of you have had to change the default configuration of any of the out-of-the-box library portlets? For example, the weather portlet, which shows some city in, in the US. Has anyone ever done that? OK, a few hands, very hum OK, what is, how do you do that? Sorry? You rewrite it? Yeah, it cannot be rewritten, right? Actually, the only way is you write a, an EXT plugin, uh, and then you have uh, a copy of the portlet.xml. You have to copy the whole definition, and then you change the default there. That's really horrible. Just by using this API, instead of being forced to use the, the portlet uh, preferences, which are meant for something else, you get free defaults at all the scopes below. So you can set the defaults for one portlet, for example, for this site or for all of the sites in these portal instances, or for all of the sites in this system. And only if it's overridden, it will uh, get it for, from whatever it's overridden. So we are applying that. But what is also very big and is allowing us to remove a lot of code is the automatic generation. So going back to the roadmap, one of the things that we found is as soon as you automatically generate the UI, at the same time, you lose you lose something, right? So I'm going to go back to this interface. So what we have right now, if you download the alpha of Liferay 7, is a big list of configuration objects. 
Each module may have one or two or, or five, uh, usually not more. And then you have a big list. As you can see there, there are 20 items per page, page one out of four, up to 80 items. So that's not very user-friendly, right? So as we are removing things from por uh, portal settings UI, that it has the items properly categorized, then we're missing that there. So one of the things we're working on is actually define a better user experience for configuring, much better actually than portal settings. And then through annotations, the developers will be able to provide categorization information in their interfaces that define the configuration. Uh, once we have that, and also some information about the specific fields, such as which widget to display for a given field, if there are several options for a given type, the idea is to take this automatically generated UI and apply it at the portal instance level. I'm really hoping that will be in 7 later to sites. So site settings will also be automatically generated. And then to uh, portlet, uh, portlet configuration as well, which right now you have to write a JSP, unless there are some people doing other things. Uh, but the idea is that after we are done with this, all you need to do, whenever you want to make your application configurable, is go and create one class like this. And everything else will be free for you. You will get very advanced configuration. And actually, the last point here in the roadmap is this support for factories. How many of you know what OSDI configuration factories are? There's one guy there. OK, so it's about the same number as people who know about the theory of general relativity, more or less. There is always one guy in the audience that knows that. OK, Jose also knows about it. Oh, you know the general theory of relativity. OK, we can talk about that one later. So it's a very cool. It actually took me a while to, to understand what it is. But it allows for much more complex configuration than what we are used to. We're actually applying it right now to one example that can help you understand what it is. Uh, basically, um, Liveray can connect to LDAP servers. right? But one of the cool features it has is that it can connect to several LDAP servers. And you can actually customize the strategies, such as look for a user here, then here, then here, or other more complicated strategies. So how do you configure many, um, many LDAP servers? So the most common way up to now is, OK, it's complicated configuration. You have to write your own app. So OSDI has this concept of factories, which basically what it means is that you can define a configuration object, just like what you were seeing here. And then you can say it's a factory. It's a weird name if you think of it that way. But once you understand it works, you know why they call it that. But basically, what it's saying is that you can have many instances of that configuration. And then you can implement, just like we are doing manually um, at Liveray, a policy to choose which configuration to, to use. So that's kind of challenging when you have to take supports, uh, sorry, scopes into account. right? Uh, and that's what we are solving right now. It's already supported by, uh, for the system scope, because config admin, uh, the spec, from OSDI already provides that. But we're working on uh, pro allowing that for all scopes. So that's all. At the end, we really, really want you guys to, be, to make it, uh, to have, or to create very, very configurable applications. And we know that the best way for us to achieve that is to make it super easy for you. Thanks a lot. So, questions? There is already the first one. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. When you have uh, things like multi-valued, uh, an array of strings like you showed, Sorry. Uh, yeah. when you have cases where you have configuration items like an array of strings like you showed, there are different UI components that can do the job. So how do you plan? So you can have, for example, uh, select uh, multiple select or two boxes and, uh, available and uh, whatever, so, and drag and drop. But how do you plan of, uh, mm -hmm. to address it? And okay. another question is about uh, Unicode. OK, let's go one by one. So um, this thing that, oh, is this running still? Yes. Can we show the slides here? Slides? Okay. Uh, Hopefully, it's possible. In any case, um, 
what I wanted to show is this UI, the automatically generated UI, that's a form. Well, it's a list, and then for each item, it's a form, right? Which is what you are referring to. So I'm talking about reuse, right? And I would be a liar if I talk about reuse and recommend reuse, but I, we don't reuse, right? So what would you use to generate that form if you were in my position? Yeah, so for example... There would have, more than, there would have to be more than one component. Mm -hmm. Candidate components for each type of, uh, you know, if we have yeah, that's the question, but how, how, how did we implement that? The way we implemented that is use a very powerful form generator that is provided with LiveRay, right? Which is it's called DDM, and that it's used by forms. I don't know if, if all of you or some of you were in the, in the talk by Marcellus about forms, and it's really, really powerful. That's the same engine that is being used here. And by using that engine, it means that we benefit from all the widgets that are already supported in DDM, but not only that, we benefit from the um, extensibility model. So you can even create your own, your own types, your own widgets, if you need something very, very specific. And it's going to be available for all of DDM, including this. All you will need to do is probably use one of the annotations that we're going to provide to create hints, and then you can use your own, your own custom widget, if it's something very, very specific. And what was the second question? Well, traditionally, dot properties files have a, an issue with Unicode, and how is that dealt with uh, with dot CSG As long as properties? everything is, is Java, then it's not a problem. If you use properties files, then you're bound to the limitations of properties files, but that's why you don't have to. One of the, of the benefits of this approach is you can still have properties files if that has benefits for, for you, but as you said, properties files have issues. So that's not at the center of the states anymore. It's just one more way of specifying the configuration, which in your case might not be the desirable one. OK, Mauro. Hello, there is a Peter. Uh, we are using mostly portal properties, just a small trick that we serialize to JSONize the whole configuration model. And it would be nice, and that's my question, if you make some adapter between uh, portlet properties and configuration API to make it mm -hmm. uh, compatible. Yeah, so this configuration API, the way we showed it here, it's meant to be used for modules. We have another API that we also use internally in the core and that ends up read, reading from portal properties. So in a way, what you said is already done, but the truth is, if, if you really are storing your configuration in, in properties files, you, you're already bound to the yeah, system scope, what we're calling system scope, which means one configuration for the whole system. Right? So you don't really get so much benefit from it. So if you really want to get the benefit from all of, of these functionalities that, that Jürgen has explained, you really need to move to, from your properties, the true source of, of information about the configuration would be a class in the, or an interface, as you saw. Right. If you want to show me the code later, we can take a look. Uh, OK. Last question. Uh, hello. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, do you plan to make annotations that are on documentary level, such as this property has been introduced in 6.2 GA4 or something, or has been deprecated since, or has been deleted since? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good point. I, I think we, we haven't thought of that, but it's a very good suggestion. So thank you. OK. Thank you very much, Jorge, uh, Jürgen. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.